I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Margaret Murphy, and to welcome her to this uh, one of our series in the public lectures hosted by the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies. Margaret has just finished her doctoral research, which she's undertaken in Mary Immaculate College, and she has just submitted her thesis, which is entitled Beyond a Single Narrative, Struggle and Agency in the Lives of Asylum Seekers and Refugees. And Margaret is currently working as teaching fellow in adult and continuing education in the department of uh, Mary Immaculate College. She has also been departmental assistant in the Department of Learning Society and Religious Education. Prior to the, this, she worked on the EDNIP uh, project. EDNIP stands for Embracing Diversity, Nurturing Integration Project. And this project was engaged with five DESH schools and was funded by the Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund. Margaret has experience as an educator at third level, but also in terms of an educator working with adults in adult education. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome her today to share with us her great expertise and experience on the theme of beyond a single narrative struggle and agency in the lives of asylum seekers. Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me. Um, can I just check that everyone can hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Great. Great, okay, so I'll just get started. Um, and I suppose interrupt me if, um, if the sound breaks down or if there's any um, problem. So um, uh, it's, it's lovely to be here and to present, to have the opportunity to speak about my own research. Um, it's kind of difficult to fit, I suppose, a thesis into a presentation, but I suppose I've picked out some of the key parts or the parts that I felt I suppose would be interesting to this audience. So I began this, I suppose, was really six years ago um, and uh, I suppose I read up you know uh, first of all before I kind of started gathering data and initially I was interested principally in I suppose um, uh, finding out I suppose the experiences of people who are asylum seeker of, or of, of asylum seeker or refugee background in education but you know it wasn't really possible to separate um, their experiences of life from education, because I suppose living as an asylum seeker or refugee is, uh, I suppose it's very different from, from the way we would normally uh, live. And trying to separate those experiences was very difficult. So the, the, the study kind of evolved then into, I suppose, looking at lives in general, rather than just looking at the place of education in people's lives. So my supervisors um, are Dr. Patricia Kieran and Prof. Uh, Ashling O'Donnell, and they've been a great inspiration to me through the throughout the six years that I've been doing this. So just I suppose to go through some definitions very quickly, and I won't spend, I won't read through all of this, but I just I suppose give my own definition. So um, I suppose an, uh, an asylum seeker is somebody who is, I suppose, trying to prove to some degree to a government that they're in need of uh, asylum or they're in need of international protection. Um, and their situation is very precarious in, in general. Um, then we've got different types of refugee and we've got convention refugees and program refugees. And um, convention refugees then, I suppose, are a people who, um, who've been approved to some degree as, you know, needing humanitarian assistance. Um, then from refugees, um, generally, um, these are particular, I suppose, um, groups of people who've been highlighted, for example, in a particular place and time, who are in need of humanitarian assistance. And I suppose the Syrians that would have come to Ireland and been placed in Bala Hadreen would be a case in point. So then direct provision, uh, we're all pretty familiar with that. Um, it gets a lot, of, a lot of news coverage, particularly in the last two years, more so than ever before. Um, and I suppose this has really, the accommodation crisis or the housing crisis in Ireland has brought this to the fore as well. 
So um, it is a system where people who are seeking asylum in Ireland, they're housed, they're given food and they're giving us given a small uh, allowance uh, each week. And there's an allowance for both children and adults, but it's a very small sum in general. So then other definitions, uh, uh, unaccompanied minor, a child, I suppose is what we say here who arrives in Ireland uh, on its own or on his or her own and there's been significant research done with unaccompanied minors by um, Mwera Nirahalik um, uh, in UCD I think she's based and she's got lots of interesting work um, with that particular group. So then an aged out unaccompanied minor I suppose is somebody who's reached the age of 18 and who is no longer um, in the, uh, so the, the, the state no longer I suppose needs to uh, recognise that um, uh, individual then as in need of foster care or in need of particular types of provision. I think I've got the age of 19 here, but I, I thought that, that should be 18. I'll need to check that. Um, so then basically when a child who's come to Ireland on their own reaches 18, they become really an asylum seeker, uh, an adult asylum seeker. Sometimes if they're in education, they are given a little bit of leeway there. They, they, they may be able to stay uh, with foster families and that until they're maybe about 19 or uh, a little bit old. Um, so uh, I'm not going to spend too long on the methodology, but um, I suppose I tried to find a methodology or an approach to doing this study, I suppose, that recognised the humanness of the kind of demands of a study like this. So um, I wanted it to, I wanted to, I suppose, look at the empirical evidence and the all the stories and the data and the details that people had told me, but I wanted to, I suppose, kind of really ask then what was going on with all of that. So I chose a phenomenological approach and looked at the work of Heidegger, Husserl and Max van Manen. And I also looked at the work of Kathleen Lynch. She has written about how we approach research in terms of, uh, I suppose, you know, she, she's critical really of uh, doing research with human participants that looks at them as variables or pieces of data to some degree and that our approaches to certain I suppose, groups in society should have I suppose, an emancipatory uh, goal. So I did uh, interviews and focus groups, uh, so it was an entirely qualitative study and um, I did my analysis using uh, Smith's interpretive phenomenological analysis. So I did 26 interviews with people who had been, uh, who had come to Ireland as, as refugees, uh, I suppose you would say they were programme refugees, but who came, one particular person I think came as early as 1987, and then other people who had come to Ireland as asylum seekers um, back in the 2000s when they had a slightly different experience possibly than people have now, and then people who are currently living in the, in the asylum process in the direct provision system. Uh, I interviewed uh, those as well. So males and females, principally females, and majority of participants as well were of African background, a few from the Middle East, um, uh, one Bosnian and uh, one Iranian, um, two Rohingya Muslims as well. Uh, so it was very interesting in different perspectives. Um, and I did two focus groups as well. One focus group was really to look at the experiences of children. So I spoke to parents about their children and their experiences. And the second focus group was to look at, um, there was a small group of students who had managed to attend third level, but who were living in direct provision. And I spoke to them because I wanted, I suppose, to look at education to some degree within this um, research. So uh, I did a long chapter on the history of immigration and asylum to Ireland and I really, really enjoyed that because I suppose it took me into history and I suppose the, the arrival of different groups and how I suppose the arrival of different groups to Ireland was understood at different stages of our history because people have been received into the country in different ways. So um, I suppose we had the Vikings, the Celts, the Normans, the English um, and they're always seen, I suppose, as invaders. Um, but uh, we recognise, I suppose, that the Vikings brought um, trade and they brought uh, new technology into the country as well. And the first uh, Vikings to come to Ireland uh, were, co were, were known to have come from the area, which is now known as Norway. Um, and they, from I suppose, from that time onwards, then um, they started building uh, towns around Ireland. So Wexford, Cork, Limerick. 
I suppose are all associated with Viking settlement. And then in the 17th century, the French Huguenots, who were French Protestants and were persecuted in France, they came in small groups to Ireland. And the Palatinate, they also arrived in Ireland and they came from a part of Germany um, called Pfalz, P-F-A-L-Z, it's a little bit difficult to pronounce. And um, they were forced to flee. So in um, 1709, a case was raised in the Irish Parliament and the House of Commons sanctioned the entry of 3,000 Palatinate. Most of them were settled on the estate of Sir Thomas Southwell um, in Rathkeel in County Limerick. But they, um, Brian Fanning, who um, is a um, professor in UCD, he's written extensively, obviously, about immigration to Ireland. And he, in a recent book called um, Migration and the Making of Ireland, he outlines how really they were treated quite badly and their houses were burnt and, you know, they, they had a difficult time here in Ireland. And I believe, I suppose, many of them left eventually and went to America. So they were located around a day in that area as well. So um, during the 18th century, then Ireland had a significant black population. And there's some really interesting work done on this by Hart and by um, Rogers as well, Meany Rogers. And I suppose most of those who uh, the black population that were in Ireland in the 18th century were domestic um, uh, staff in houses and Quoting from the Freeman's Journal on the 19th of October, 1779, there was a stir of attention on St. Stephen's Green in Dublin. A female black uh, and child was so closely pressed by the multitude of people crowding around and staring at her that being much frightened, in vain she endeavoured to retire. The child was so terrified as to burst into tears and notwithstanding such evidence, evident signs of fears, it was with the utmost of difficulty a few reasonable persons could extricate her from the crowd and get her safe out of the walks. So that's just a little piece from Hart, um, originally taken from the Freeman's Journal. So I suppose, you know, to see a black person in Ireland at the time was quite unusual. Um, so then, um, I suppose in more recent times, I suppose there was very little immigration into Ireland during the time of the famine. But then um, in the uh, early part or the, 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 I suppose, after the foundation of the state, groups of Hungarians, Chileans, Vietnamese, in a more kind of a structured way, arrived in Ireland. Um, again, the Hungarian group, um, they didn't have a wonderful experience. They were located in um, in uh, Naklashim, where there is a, a direct provision centre at the moment. And 541 of them arrived in 1951. And at the time, as was Ireland, was fairly conservative and was impoverished. So um, the Catholic Church did welcome them and there was a popular support um, uh, for the admittance of the refugees. And it, it owed much to Catholic solidarity, according to Brian Fanning. Um, a local bishop in County Clare, where they were housed, referred to the Hungarians as brave soldiers of the church. Um, now, Pros prostrate in a Gethsemane of anguish and suffering. Um, so that's from the Clare Champion in 1956. So um, then the Chilean group arrived um, in the wake of General Pinochet's uh, very cruel regime in Chile. And um, they had a slightly better experience. They were smaller in number. Some of them did settle and some of their families and descendants, some of them are still alive to the best of my knowledge. I know one particular person who was at the time I was gathering data um, in Shannon and her grandchildren um, uh, spoke with me as well, just at one stage, just around the around the study. So um, then you also had the Vietnamese who had arrived and they had a difficult experience. Many these were what we called Vietnamese old people at the time. There were 582 of them that arrived in Ireland and they were settled around the country. There was a small bit more of a structured programme for these than had been there originally. And um, some of them were located in County Kerry and in other parts of the country, but they had very poor English and some of them were illiterate as well. And they found it very difficult and eventually moved to Dublin to be together but they I mean when they arrived uh, back in the 19 I'm going to say 1979 you know there was very little employment and many of them remained unemployed for many many years for a decade in fact some of them then opened restaurants and things like that 
So then uh, we had the Bosnian and, and Kosovo <clears throat> groups and there was a much more structured programme at the time when they arrived. It was the first, it was a more successful programme really um, and they got considerable assistance from the state and many of them stayed. And then um, I suppose Ireland to some degree was forced to kind of comply um, with uh, EU regulations and decisions and um, I suppose the establishment of the Convention of Human Rights um, in the 50s, uh, you know, slowly, I suppose, meant that, you know, more compliance was required. So uh, then in 1999, you had the common um, European asylum uh, system. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking for my few notes on this um, directive. Yes. So it, I suppose it kind of tried to set out some minimum standards for people who arrived in the country. Um, but Ireland didn't really um, sign up to that initially or to some parts of it, from what I can remember. Um, so then, uh, in, I suppose in the early 2000s, I suppose the issue of in-migration really came to the fore when much larger numbers of people started coming to Ireland. and. You know, many people refer to this time, uh, I suppose, or at the time they referred to, you know, migration into Ireland, kind of ignoring that this had happened for many years, um, but not, I suppose, possibly to the same degree or on the same scale. Um, so then the, uh, the, the direct provision system then was set up, I suppose, in response to that in the year 2000. And initially it was set up as a temporary system but it has remained 20 years later, it's still in place and there has been much criticism and opposition to it. And there have been attempts at reform. The McMahon report, which was set up in 2014, made certain recommendations and some of these were fulfilled. And But it's not really clear what progress was really made on that. Um, and, you know, it may have different, differed from one set to another. But currently there's an expert working group as well, headed by Catherine Day, and uh, she's made uh, lots of other recommendations um, around provision of accommodation and um, people having, I suppose, their own individual door key to their own accommodation and being entitled to driver's license and expansion of the right to work. So initially, uh, Asylum seekers didn't have the right to work, but they do now from 20, I'm going to say about 2018 uh, onwards, uh, but again, under limited conditions. So um, I haven't included this in my thesis, but I just thought it might be an interesting piece. So I suppose the number of people who are displaced, you know, is, is on the rise all of the time. And, and many people are displaced within their own countries or within their own continents as well, which is something I suppose, we don't always think of. Um, so these are just some figures. In 2016, the population of forcibly displaced, displaced persons reached a record high of 65.6 million, and 2.8 million of whom were asylum seekers, and 22.5 million whom were recognised as refugees. So these are just some of the statistics. Um, again, I don't have this included because mine is not kind of this kind of a quality, quantitative type of study. It's just really focused on the experiences, but I just thought it might be of interest um, to people. So um, I suppose in 2019, the nationality which um, the, the uh, people from Albania sought asylum more than any other group. And you can see the breakdown here of the figures. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting as well, because it changes over time. If we look at it from the early 2000s up until now, you know, the um, there, there is changes to these kind of numbers. So. Um, I suppose just coming back to my own study then, um, the theories I suppose that I used to try and I suppose understand and so the narratives came from Hannah Arendt and she talks uh, at length about what it is to be stateless, the kind of existential and ontological harms which this brings and I tried to I suppose relate that to uh, the people who lived in direct provision that have very few rights really, while they're not legally deemed to be stateless because that term statelessness isn't really, um, I don't think there's a definition of it in, in, in Irish law to, to, to some degree, but so I, I tried to use her work to kind of, I suppose, uh, unearth some of the, the, the insights within the, the stories that people told me. And then I used Giorgio 
uh, idea of inclusive exclusion that you know we were willing to the country's willing to accept people take people in offer them the minimum standards but they're still excluded from mainstream society so it's um it's kind of uh, what he calls an inclusive exclusion and then uh, going back even further in history to Immanuel Kant his uh his ideas about offering hospitality to the stranger um uh, it, this could be conditional or unconditional and finally, uh, I have one chapter that I suppose at the end of one particular chapter that I've looked at, uh, which I suppose looks at the idea of the nation state and how it developed. And I suppose the the idea of the citizen and non-citizen has come from that notion of the, the, the nation and its boundary, the nation state with its ba boundaries. And uh, Selah Ben Habib and Richard Kearney have, I suppose, imagined another way of, of um, political, uh, uh, another kind of a political or uh, geographical model, um, or for, for want of a better word, and they talk about a European model of federal regionalism. So, you know, I suppose this is, uh, uh, I suppose, imagined uh, to some degree what, what could be or what could be different. So um, I have a chapter as well, just very much focused on the asylum seeker as opposed to the refugee. And um, I entitled this the decontextualized world of the asylum seeker because I suppose the world is so removed from what we know. And they described a sense of imprisonment and the constant, I suppose, sense of um, uh, not being believed. I sh uh, maybe disbelief isn't the right, right term there stories of incapacitation, not being able to do things. And I think this this has changed slightly with the right to work. And I think um, the, the work of Massey, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland, have really kind of has done a lot to, I suppose, raise awareness around um, uh, the kind of lives that uh, asylum seekers live. So I think a lot of the stories I suppose I gathered were from people who were in the asylum process uh, back in the 2000s and the early 2000s and some people were in the, uh, the the direct provision system for 12 years so during that time they couldn't work or if they worked they had to work in a voluntary capacity and so it was all very difficult so um, and they talk about you know other people who sat in front of the tv all day and that kind of uh, enforced idleness that was really part of I suppose the culture of direct provision initially and how damaging that was and never knowing what the next day would bring. Um, so there was kind of always a sense of a culture of suspicion, you know, that you're not quite accepted or that you've got to prove yourself um, before you you can be accepted into the country or be, before you can give given permission to remain. So again, I mentioned mistrust. So there's huge mistrust among, I think, the asylum seeking community, or there used to be that sense that they couldn't really trust the state, they couldn't trust others couldn't trust other people within the uh, direct provision system sometimes. Um, and one uh, particular lady spoke about, you know, um, when she went for her hearing um, to, I suppose, make her case uh, in order to, um, to be allowed to remain, that, you know, what kind of a story do you tell? And that you needed to display refugeeness. You needed to have a certain type of story that fitted a particular image of what a refugee should be. And um, Alexandra Betts, who is based in Oxford, has done uh, quite a bit of work on, you know, um, what is understood by a refugee and and an asylum seeker, particularly a refugee. But you know, he thinks like the term is far too narrow and that it should be expanded because. Um, the, obviously, the risk of the risk of insecurity is not enough. You've got to prove that you've you've been a victim, I suppose, of some kind of insecurity or violence or discrimination. And then I have a chapter as well on how time is experienced by people who are living in the direct provision system. So they describe it as prison, obviously. So it's like doing time, killing time. And some then kind of experience more hopeful waiting. They just don't think about the waiting. They get out into society, they become involved, and they and they do things. Um, so then uh, I've got another chapter really about, which is about resilience, and I, I entitled this "Act of Survival," 
because I suppose we um, would find it hard to believe that people have to live in such ways and the kind of desperate measures that people took even to get here, swallowing passports and um, hiding in toilets and airports for a couple of days before being able to get on flights and that. And these three participants, um, I suppose, exhibited different, um, very different kind of survival strategies or techniques. And Ahmed was a Syrian refugee and he in some ways um, uh, Somebody has their microphone on, sorry, it's just distracting me. Could, could you just turn your microphones off? Thanks. So, um, Ahmed, um, yes, he was about 28 at the time and he described, uh, you know, his journey out of uh, Aleppo with his family and he had to leave a brother behind who was trying to finish a degree course. And then the struggle it was later to try and reunite that brother with the rest of the family in Ireland. So, um, he was, you know, he has great narratives of determination and, you know, he said things like, I, I suppose I could have included some quotations here, but he said things like, you know, nothing will ever be difficult again, nothing will ever be impossible having lived through that. And, you know, he tried to really, I suppose, embrace his his new life in Ireland and he, he, he didn't, he, he really resisted this kind of binary of was he Syrian or was he, you know, was he going to be Irish? And he said he could be both. And so it was really, really, really interesting uh, insights. And then Alan was an unaccompanied minor, but he was obviously an aged out unaccompanied minor when I met him. He was 19. And um, again, he kind of come to Ireland on his own and just very interesting stories. And Mwirini Rahalik, who's done a lot of research with unaccompanied minors as well, she states that a lot of the time, you know, young people who come like that to, on their own, they kind of stay on their own and they manage on their own. And obviously with the help of agencies like the Irish Refugee Council and um, TUSLA and schools um, and that, you know, these children are supported. But or I suppose he was no longer a child at that stage, but, you know, that they manage quite, quite well on their own. You know, I know it sounds dreadful to us, but um, it, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting. So if you, if you get a chance to read her work, it's really, really interesting. Um, and then Paulina was uh, 47 when I interviewed her. And again, she had been very ill before she left. She'd been imprisoned in Zimbabwe. And she, um, when she came to Ireland, she suffered a lot of bouts of ill health, mental health and different breakdowns and things like that. So she described that and her kind of recovery out of that through education, really. So um, access to education was really important for everybody. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a small bit of a grey area. I'm not, not quite sure, you know, how easy it is to um, sometimes I think different setting, different settings, you know, kind of wave various policies and they let people who are asylum seekers into study. And then um, well, asylum seekers have the right to further education. Um, but higher education, it's, it's a little bit uh, trickier, but um, I'll, and I'll come to that to various initiatives um, that have been set up and that um, have, have worked really well. So um, obviously children are allowed to attend school until the age of 18 or 19 to complete their leaving cert. But then they really encounter significant difficulties in continuing beyond that. Um, so some of the obstacles to education that people mentioned in their interviews were, I suppose, the physical location of the centres, uh, the non-recognition of their prior qualifications, funding, legal barriers, social barriers. Um, and um, I suppose I used the work of Paolo Freire in just, I suppose, recognising what education could do for people. I mean, it's not it's, it's not the answer to everything, but it certainly allowed people to move into a different space and a different headspace, physical space and headspace. And, um, you know, it, uh, I suppose it gave people a bit more structure to their day, the a routine, um, allowed them to, I suppose, exercise their minds and feel that they were making some progress, even if they were stuck in other ways in terms of being in direct provision, you know, they could do things to improve their lives. And sometimes it was seen as well by some people as a way to advance their claim 
uh, for uh, you know, leave, leave to remain or subsidiary protection in Ireland so that they would have a greater case. They would show that they were more established here, that they were willing to learn and to, I suppose, become part of society. Um, so I'll just move on from that. So these are some of the initiatives, um, I suppose, that uh, have been around for some of them for longer than others to, I suppose, try and improve access to education. And I'm sure there's others here that I haven't included. So the City of Dublin Education and Training Board and Separated Children's Service has offered an educational service to support separated children since 2001. Uh, vocational training is available um, to protect you. Yeah, so I suppose I should have said for further education there and vocational training is available to protect applicants to to, uh, to protection applicants yet yeah, to asylum applicants um, who um, uh, who have successfully received permission to access the labour market. OK, a pilot uh, support study was introduced in 2015 as well. Um, and there have been various grant schemes as well, but uh, when you look closer at some of these uh, grant schemes, very few people often uh, are eligible uh, for them. Um, so there's no automatic access to third level education um, uh, for people. Um, I mean, they many of the people I interviewed, their, their children had received places in college on various courses. But for financial reasons, they couldn't um, they couldn't take up the places um, or sometimes they accepted them, but then they were forced to move. That happened on, uh, to a number of applicants, uh, a number of uh, participants, I should say. So. Um, uh, so then the University of Sanctuary um, initiative, I suppose, is one of the more successful um, initiatives and there are online courses, online third level courses offered through that, as well as scholarships um, for face-to-face uh, -face attendance or day attendance, whatever you might want to call it. So um, uh, this was Claude and Claude had spent, spent he was from Burundi, he was a native French speaker. Um, and he had arrived in Ireland with very little English, but so determined and um, he had never really wanted to stay, spend any time in the direct provision centre. He'd always worked as a volunteer um, and, uh, you know, just wanted to, he always imagined himself as not being an asylum seeker. Um, he, uh, you know, so he, he kind of imagined a different life for himself from the very beginning. And uh, even though I suppose he had to wait 12 years to kind of really realise that, um, I think it kind of kept him going all through that time. So he explains here, so all the time I was being in the asylum process, you know, you can't work, you can't study, you can't, you know. Um, while there, you can do some basic things, but I somehow went along with that for a while. And then I went to work as a volunteer assistant and I came here. So through my volunteer work, I was able to get some studies and some expertise. So um, he went down to college after that, you know, and he um he stated when he uh, after he got his permission to remain and he said he was going to go to college he wasn't going to work because it, for him it was like a little bit of revenge on the state for making him wait for so long um uh so then this was anesh and uh anesh was a uh, younger he was about 26 or, or so and he had been in the country for yeah about six years maybe was about 28 so he said it was really frustrating in the way that some in that way sometimes, for instance, I was kept for like six years. I came when I was just 19 or so, taking six years out of my life. That's quite a long time. I could be in my final year now because of the system, because of the program. Now I couldn't progress. So it's just unfortunate that sometimes people really want to be responsible. They want to be able to become taxpayers at the end of the day by going to school and getting a job and by supporting a society that will embrace them. But it's unfortunate that you can't do it. So um, he had become involved in the University of Sanctuary a project after that or around that time. So he had gone on to college. So then um, Beth, who was a very shy person, as she was in Zimbabwe and, and she'd um, lost two family members while she'd been in, um, two of her family members had passed away in Zimbabwe while she was in direct provision, but she couldn't go and visit either of them. And there was 
there is sadness to her, I thought. Um, so she, again, had become involved in uh, further education and she said, I made friends and I got references because I did work experience in a nursing home and I started working here as well. So she did lots of voluntary work and um, uh, worked, in, I suppose, in the area of social care. Um, so that was Alan's story again. He was the unaccompanied minor. He was so proud of his uh, all he, if, of his achievement in 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 school. And just, I suppose school was such a huge part of an unaccompanied minor's life because it was one of the I suppose few structures and fixtures and you know thing that offered routine and um, uh, continuity for him. Uh, so. Um, and then I drew on Homi Baba's idea of the third space when I spoke about edu uh, education and the educational space, um, uh, that it was I suppose, an interruptive, uh, interrogative and enunciative. And uh, it was, I suppose, a space that allowed for uh, imagination and for, for, for creativity. Um, so um, uh, such a space as uh, favour the blurring of fixed and binary notions of identity and who can belong. So some of the students, I might have this quotation a little bit further on, some of the students as well who participated in the University of Sanctuary project, you know, described being uh, in, in, in a college in a university and um, uh, where other people mistook them for, you know, international students and how great that felt. And um, they didn't have to explain to anybody that they lived in direct provision like a student was just a student and was just nobody else. It didn't matter uh, about where you came from, where you lived. Um, so this was Diane and um, she said, you know, being included, being welcomed into that space, uh, recognised, like, you know, while you were there, there was no one who knows what your residence, residency status is, is in Ireland, in Ireland is, or what your living conditions are. Not one of them cares, but people just look at you and see you as a human being, a student. I remember we felt like we were international students. Yes, so that's the quotation there. I wasn't sure whether I had included that. And they could really forget about, you know, the Direct Provision Centre. And they describe um, kind of going back there. They they um, would get the bus out of the college and, you know, or at the university. And it would be, you know, a bit of a journey uh, on the bus and maybe two bus journeys in some cases. And, um, uh, you know, when they, when as as the, as the bus got closer then to the centre, the kind of sinking feeling that uh, they had as, as they returned to, um, you know, this kind of, I suppose, prison for want of a better word. Um, so, um, so the, there's so many conclusions. I couldn't really, I suppose, fit them in there. I suppose I looked more at the conclusions maybe around education, but. Um, uh, you know, the importance of pedagogical relationships, the anon anonymity of the university, you know, how we can identify as well and how we can identify differently if we're allowed into different spaces, um, spaces where education uh, takes place. I thought this was a really good phrase, the spatialization of otherness, you know, how, again, we can be um, framed in particular ways in particular spaces. Um, and the idea that education, you know, it's so much more than schooling, it allows for personal development and opportunity to meet pe peers, uh, to move on from a particular framing or, uh, you know, a particular narrative that others have chosen for us. So, um, uh, so that's really it. Um, I wrote the thesis as well in a different, the it has an alternative thesis format, so I suppose it makes some contribution to um, uh, uh, to, to that aspect of, I suppose, method or format, uh, because there is um, this, it's, it's kind of set out as thematized chapters rather than I have one, I have a methodology chapter, which is my uh, second chapter. And then after that, it's a thematized chapters where I've got theory and I suppose findings and stories and um, all of that in, in each chapter after that. So